It takes our genius just one day to knock off this first sheet, so it's a bit soon to call him the hero artist of the Republic. And then, well, it's back to business as usual. Yet more muses and meditations on art. He even thinks one of those might do for the job he'd promised for the Spanish pavilion at the International Exhibition. And then, life caught up with art. It's about four in the afternoon in the little town of Guernica, 15 miles from Bilbao in the north of Spain. 7,000 souls going about their market day business in the ancestral homeland of the Basques. A people with their own language, culture, and fierce sense of identity. In the raging civil war, the Basques were stalwartly anti-Franco. A black speck appears in the blue. The solitary plane is German, from the Luftwaffe's Condor Legion. It wheels over the town, then, almost casually, drops six bombs. Waves of German and Italian aircraft flying in formation created a relentless storm of havoc. Over 5,000 bombs were dropped on the defenseless town. When the people of Guernica fled into the streets and fields, the pilots strafed them with machine gun fire. A rain of incendiary bombs finished the job, turning the town into an ashy cauldron. Sixteen hundred and forty-five die. Thousands more are terribly wounded. The commander of the Condor Legion, Colonel Wolfram von Richthofen, was extremely gratified by the action. So surgically precise, so tremendously modern. Guernica literally leveled to the ground. Bomb craters in the streets. Simply terrific. Perfect conditions for a great victory. There was nothing in Guernica that could possibly be designated a military target. What was special about Guernica was the brutality and clarity of the objective. To terrorize defenseless civilians from the air and to send a message to the rest of Spain and to the world. This is what we can do, and this is what we will do. George Steer, correspondent for the London Times, covering the Basque War from Bilbao, got himself to Guernica. Blocks of wreckage slithered and crashed from the houses. And from their sides, which were still erect, the polished heat struck at our cheeks and eyes. Throughout the night, houses were falling until the streets became long heaps of red, impenetrable debris. Guernica had gone cubist. Steer's report is reprinted in the French paper, Ce Soir, with a dramatic front page picture. The nocturnal inferno burns itself into Picasso's visual imagination. 
That's why he pictures Guernica as a night massacre, even though it was actually death in the afternoon. In his Paris studio, Picasso summons art for the most serious thing he's ever attempted, telling the truth. Of course, he's not going to compete with Steer's gritty report from Guernica. But if the painting succeeds, it will transcend mere factual chronicle. It will be cubism with a conscience. What Picasso was setting out to make was something foreign to the very nature of modern art, the art he had defined. He was about to try and make a truly modern history painting. It was the tallest order of his life to turn from icon breaker to icon maker. So, Everything he'd ever touched in his art and his life had to come together for this one moment. The excitement of modernism, the obsession with the art of the past, and his own intimate experiences of love and grief. He would need all the help he could get, but there was an accomplice waiting in the wings. He'd met her in a Paris cafe. He could hardly have missed her. Her name is Dora Maher, a Croatian photographer, intellectual, and accomplished surrealist. <laughs> Picasso made an offer for the blood-stained glove and won a fiery new lover and a creative partner. Dora became a fixture in the studio and Picasso's unofficial photographer. Capturing him at work as Guernica evolved. On May the 1st, 1937, Picasso gets down to it. He starts with rough sketches, barely more than scribbles. Graphite on paper thoughts racing ahead of the hand. And the essential cast of characters so long on his mind, so deep in his psyche, reappear. The wounded horse. The massive bull. The candlelight bearer. Don't imagine, though, that Picasso is in the remorseless grip of his new vision. All through the next week, with the deadline for the Paris Fair coming on fast, he does no work at all on the painting. He goes to see his other lover, Marie Therese, and their new baby on the weekend. And he umpires a catfight between her and Dora. Heady emotions swirl around Picasso and he can't resist transferring the complicated agony of his personal life to his political art. <laughs> Heads of women, trapped with arteries of excruciating pain, punctured with tears, begin to appear in the Guernica drawings. He's become the impresario of anguish. Mm. 
Marie Therese and his young daughter Maya visit the studio too. The toddler smearing her hands in the fresh paint of Guernica. Visions of domestic tragedy. Dead babies. Distraught mothers process through his mind. He begins working on the actual painting. 20 feet long and 12 feet high, the canvas is too tall to fit between the roof rafters and the floor of the studio. So it's propped up against the wall. Dora snaps Picasso as he perches on a ladder to reach the top of the painting. Picasso chain smokes his way through it in a storm of furious creativity. In the early versions of the painting, there are images of hope and defiance. But as Picasso gets deeper into Guernica, those slight gestures of optimism collapse into the bleaker, overwhelming tragedy. clenched socialist fist of resistance rising from the pile of bodies appears in several early sketches, but this thought fades and disappears from the final painting. In earlier versions, the shrieking horse with a fatal gash in its side had a little winged horse, Pegasus, the mythical symbol of the birth of art and poetry, born out of the wound, as if to say something good may come from blood. But it ends as a deep, black, lozenge-shaped hole in a horse, right at the optical dead center of the painting. The fallen warrior originally was grander, stronger, his head helmeted like a classical hero. that Picasso has turned the warrior on his back, mouth open, gaping, slack-jawed, helpless. If he's a good partisan, Picasso ought to be delivering something upbeat amidst the carnage, but he hasn't the stomach for callow optimism. So the signs of redemption now are puny, though telling a single daisy, and on the fallen warrior's hand, startlingly, an unmistakable puncture mark. The stigmata of the martyred Christ. What brought this into Picasso's head? Wasn't he supposed to be the worldly modernist? Wasn't it General Franco who was supposed to be the Christian soldier? Well, that was the point, of course. The idea was to turn the tables on all those holy rollers. What was in Picasso's head now was one more indelible image of the agony of his nation, and one which every Spaniard would have known, Goya's 3rd of May, 1808. This, too, was the response of an artist seething at cruelty and massacre. In this case, the execution in Madrid of the rebels who had risen against Napoleon's invading army. But it's colored by an ancient Christian hope, especially deeply rooted in Spain, that of salvation. 